This is the homework video for 8.3 where we're estimating a population mean using a confidence interval. Now we've talked about this in class quickly as an introduction that now instead of going from knowing the parameter of the population and its distribution, meaning knowing the true mean and the true standard deviation and seeing how that relates to the sampling distribution as we did in chapter 7, uh, we're more in grounded in reality where we need to find out about the parameter and we're using the sample statistic to do that. So the problem here is that our standard deviation was based on the population standard deviation. So we would use for a sample mean we would take the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size because we knew as sample size gets larger the spread gets smaller, the standard deviation gets smaller and that can be seen here where you can see a larger sample size, much taller curve, far less spread meaning less variability from the true value. You can also see margin of error is represented by one direction from this vertical line. As the sample size gets bigger, our margin of error gets smaller, and the confidence interval is represented by the two dots there, the lower bound and the upper bound. So a larger, smaller sample size, larger margin of error, larger confidence interval. We would like a small confidence interval, ideally, because we want to get as close to estimating the true parameter as possible. So our problem here is we don't know the population standard deviation and we'll get errors we won't um, our estimates won't be accurate enough using a Z statistic so what we're introducing is a T statistic which is a standardized test statistic meaning a number of standard deviations from the mean however it changes based on sample size since our standard deviation varies on sample size so first in the case where we know the sample mean true standard deviation not the sample mean but the population if we know that then we can still use these formulas because look how um, our standard deviation depends on the population standard deviation. So if I know that, this works, and I can use a critical value for z just the same. Um, perhaps some people would use a pilot study, another type of study to get a good estimate on what the true standard deviation is. Um, this doesn't happen a lot, so oftentimes we have to use t. But if we know the population standard deviation, we can use z. Um, we would plug this in as we did in class if we wanted to make margin of error smaller than a certain value. Z would depend on our confidence level, uh, true standard deviation, and we're solving for the square root of n by plugging in the largest margin of error we'd want. Let's say if we wanted a 2% margin of error, we'd plug in 0 0.02 there. If it was a 95% confidence interval, 1.96 for Z, and the population standard deviation, and then you just got to flex those algebra skills, multiply by root n on both sides, divide by your margin of error, square both sides to figure out the minimum sample size to give us a margin of error. We'll do an example like that in class. That's not the big focus. So if that's a little, um, if that's giving you trouble, don't have a big worry about that. Just follow along as we do it in class. So we can only do this when the standard deviation is known to the population. Oftentimes we don't know that. So this works when we know the population standard deviation. If we don't, then we know that our standard deviation of our sample, if we have to use the standard deviation of the sample, we know it varies based on sample size. So we have to have critical values that also vary based on sample size. And that's where degrees of freedom comes in for the t-distribution. Now a good way to remember this is ZAPTAX. Z-score for a p-hat, so Z for a sample proportion, T for a sample mean. Except for in that rare case when we know the true population standard deviation. So take a look at how the t-critical value is different. It's still a uh, value minus the mean, but here's the sample mean minus uh, true mean over the standard deviation, uh, over the quantity of the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. So that's our T critical value. Now, we use it with the degrees of freedom. Like I said, it varies on sample size. So we take the sample size and subtract to 1. Um, the reason for that gets a little more complicated. Um, and if you have a question about that, it's a little beyond the scope of this video. Um, I encourage you to come into class and we'll continue to talk about it. However, you use your table, and here's where I think the table's easier than the calculator. You look at, if you have a sample size of 49, 49 minus 1 is 48, find degrees of freedom 48, and then along the bottom of our table B with the T distribution, you're going to find 98% confidence interval, 97, 90, 95, and find the appropriate, find where the degrees of freedom, and that row, and the column representing your confidence level intersect and that's your t critical value. Now remember that constructing a confidence interval would be our statistic which is x bar our sample mean plus or minus our t critical value in most cases uh, times the standard error which is what we call the standard deviation. So uh, we're, we have this written this way on your formula sheet and this is what it breaks down to your sample mean plus or minus the t critical value that I just discussed 
times the standard error, which is just the standard deviation of a statistic when we're using it for a confidence interval. Now, um, the conditions still have to be met. We need to have an unbiased estimator, so in, things need to be randomized for SRS and random assignment. We need to either have a population that's normal and know that, or a sample size of greater than or equal to 30. Remember, that's a central limit theorem. Um, and that as our sample size gets bigger, we approach a central limit, which is just the true value we're trying to approach, meaning our spread gets smaller, our distribution looks more normal. An independent condition where if we sample less than 10% of the population, we can use our formula for standard deviation to keep observations independent from each other. Let's look at an example. We've got a random sample of 30 college students from 2013, and each spent an average of 8.46 continuing on each hours, um, hours each week on social media. They found that the standard deviation of the sample is 2.445733. Um, this is more digits than we need to include. We usually round to the nearest hundredth or thousandth. Um, here we're trying to find the 95% confidence interval for the true average time spent by college students between the ages of 16 and 22. We are going to use, as usual, state, plan, do, and conclude. State, we state what we're trying to solve. Uh, basically, this whole way of solving would allow the problem to stand by itself without looking at this. So if somebody just looked at your work, they'd know what the problem you're trying to solve, what parameter you're trying to estimate, what your confidence level is, if conditions are met, and be able to check your calculations. So we want to estimate the true mean mu, the true average amount, or we could say population amount, or actual average amount of hours spent on social media by college students from ages 16 to 22 each week with 95% confidence. So we say what we're trying to estimate, the population or true actual average, define the variable specifically, and the confidence level. Check our conditions. We have a simple random sample, so an unbiased estimator. Remember, this means the average of our sampling distribution. That was every possible sample, each one of them being an average. Um, all, the average of all those averages would equal our true mean, what we're trying to estimate. So things should be centered around the true value we want to estimate. We have a sample size of 30. So even we don't, though we don't know the population is normal, the CLT, the central limit theorem, lets us know our sampling distribution should be approximately normal. And we want to just show that we assume there are at least 3,000 teenagers driving. That's totally reasonable. And I, a good way to show that is 10 times the sample size. Uh, so let's plug in and now do our calculations. Here we are on the do step. We plug in our point estimate, which is our sample mean, x bar, plus or minus the critical value t, times our standard error. And our standard error here is this, the standard deviation of our sample size divided by the square root of the sample size. Of, sorry, standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. Now I'd like you to use the table in your back of your book, or inverse t, which you can see I do on page 506. I think the table's easier. I'd go there. Find degrees of freedom. Remember, that's n minus 1. And then find where that column intersects the 95% confidence interval. Check your work. You need to be able to find that t value. So, and plug that in. Check your work by using this calculator function. Stat, test, uh, go to 8, t interval. Enter your sample mean, standard deviation, and n. And then conclude by answering this multiple choice. Uh, this would be your first fill-in. The upper bound would be your second. We are 95% confidence that the interval from lower bound to upper bound, which one of these is appropriate, captures the true average amount of hours spent on social media by college students from ages 16 to 22 each week. Pause now. Look over your, uh, look over your formulas and answer this multiple choice. We'll talk about robust procedures some more in class. It's just when our conditions can still hold up even if we haven't met 30. So if we have a sample size less than 15, the data has to be pretty close to normal, roughly symmetric, with no outliers. And we can still say the normal conditions met. If it's at least 15, we can use them um, unless we get the presence of really strong skewness. And then T procedures hold up for values above 30. So these are kind of like slight exceptions that we'll go over in class. OK, so here's your free response. Uh, why do we sometimes have to use a T statistic for our critical value in a confidence interval instead of a Z statistic? Some key things I want you to address. When this must be done and why. And then use words like standard deviation, sample size, the diff and then show the difference between sample proportions and sample means. Uh, not a long answer, just two to three sentences. And get to the point of what the difference is, please. So pause this, read over the 8.3 summary in your book, look through the examples, especially the visuals on the critical value, uh, and then submit your free response answer.